For me, it was, I have to be powerful right now because if I crumble, this whole production will crumble. You know, I don't have the leisure to lose it right now. And I think that was the greatest gift that I had on the set, that the stakes were so high the whole time that I didn't have an opportunity to break down in any kind of way. And if I did, I probably would have taken it. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Devika Bizet is an actor. She sat down with me on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to talk about the work. You said somewhere that classic Indian dance is a part of all of your preparation work. Mm. And I just, all these images started coming in my mind of what that, what that means and what, I was just fascinated by that. Can you talk about that a little bit? So I've been studying Indian classical dance since I was four years old. Um, and my mother was my teacher. And because it's something that I did from such a young age, and it's such an intense art, uh, you need to know how to chant in Sanskrit. You need to have the athletic ability to dance for two hours completely solo um, while also having expression on your face that you're not entirely exhausted. Um, you need to know how to get into your costume and do makeup and understand the translation um, of every single text that you're dancing in many different Indian languages so it's an all-encompassing art um, and it's one of the few things in my life that I have done for 20 something years um, and the training for that was so intense just because it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years when art was taken very very seriously um, and that kind of craft is something that is hard to come by these days, I think. And um, I get a lot of questions from people asking to learn Indian classical dance, and they want to take a few classes here and there, and then huh. do a concert and do something kind of um, new age and pop without understanding that to really dive into an art form like that, it does take years and years and years. And it's one of the only art forms not the only, obviously, but it's um, one of the art forms where you get better as you get older, um, mm -hmm. as your expressions mature, mm -hmm. which is really interesting because dance you usually think of as, as you get older and your body yeah. is not where it was and your athletic stamina is not where it was, um, it becomes harder, but actually because there's so much storytelling involved in the art form, um, you, it's like wine, right? It just gets better mm. with age. And so um, learning such a tough art form from such a young age really just taught me how to pay attention mm. to my craft and to really dedicate my mind to whatever I was doing. And so I think that space is where I know how to apply my self as best as I can. Yeah. And that's why my Indian classical dance training is always what I come back to when I approach any role. It just sounds like that is such a great um, uh, like foundation for concentration, for Focus. Meditation, focus, yeah. all of those things. And I, I also think it's just important to have many different tools that you can pull from. Um, so obviously if I'm working on some Meisner kind of thing and I'm, if that is helping me at that point, sometimes if you do the same thing over and over again, you get to a point where it loses its uh, power almost. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, you need to have another tool to use at that moment. Um, 
And so having an option of what to do when you're stuck in a character that you're not quite able to grasp in that way yeah. um, is great. It's really nice having many, many different ideas of what acting is and how, yeah. how to pull that. And in Indian classical dance, you know, there's like the old, um, the old techniques of the different motions, right? So there's love, valor, anger, greed, peace, you know, all of these different emotions. And in America, we learn to go inside out, right? Where you think about what kind of things would make you behave in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the story behind why you're doing what you're doing. And what I've learned is sometimes if you just do it, if you jump off that cliff and if you don't question why you're angry and just get there, it all comes, right? Mm -hmm. And you just have to trust your body to do that. Well, that's interesting. Um, yes. And it's an interesting way of looking at it. And I think in England, they also have a similar um, ideas about how to get to those places. Um, but especially, you know, I've done a lot of movies where I have to cry on cue all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been asked that question a lot. You know, how do you, do you think of sad things? Do you whatever? And it's obviously it's not as, as simple as that, as yeah. I'm sure you, you know. But sometimes just not thinking about it at all and just doing it is the answer that I found works for me. I talked to a director once who said that children make amazing actors because they don't ask you all those questions. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And when you tell an actor, if you tell a child actor what to do, the way you do it is just by saying, okay, you're going to go over there and you're going to cry. You're going to look at him and, you know, mm -hmm. do whatever. And they don't ask why and they just are able to yeah. do it because they're mind is still in that place where it's easy for them mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and I think bringing that childish sense of not asking a question about every little thing you have to do is easy. My acting coach here, Kelly Kimball, um, has these amazing things in class where she, if you're just doing rage, right? You just get there, get there, and just start yelling and start really emoting any of any of that anger that is coming out of any place. And then by the end of it, you are authentically, naturally in that place, mm. even though when you started out, you were just making noises and not yeah. really doing anything. Yeah. It does rev you up. You tell another story of having this nine yard sari that you had to wear for the man who knew infinity mm -hmm. and wanting to learn how to wrap it yourself. Your mother was helping you, I think, mm -hmm. with it, but you wanted to do that yourself and it paid dividends for your performance in that movie. It's hard for us to think of you as a modern person. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I think this all worked toward that. But why was it important for you to learn to wrap it yourself? Someone might be like, all right, really, like, I have to learn that. What is that going to do for me at, in, in the role? Everything. Actually... I think wearing a piece like that is hard enough. And I had to convincingly wear something that I wore, you know, that in that role I wore every day for however many years, right? Since I was born, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and so being able to wrap it on my own just gave credence or helped me be the character in that, uh, in that costume yeah. um, and helped me really feel that that is something that I could wear every yeah. day and it's not this nine yards of fabric that is completely unwieldy that I don't know how to hold and don't know how to mm. walk in and don't know how to run in. Um, this is something that 
I have been wearing every single day, you know. Yeah. Um, and so wrapping it was just one part of it. Um, and so I wrapped it many, many times and I got to a point where I, I could do it quickly, mm. which for me was the important thing, mm -hmm. that I could just be able to throw it on as people do, mm -hmm. um, go to the bathroom easily, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, all of those things, I think, just helped me get into that uh, character so much more. And I don't know if, if I didn't know how to do that, how much it would have hurt my on-screen mm. performance, but it helped me inside, you know? Yeah. Um, it helped me yeah. believe in my own character and believe yeah. in my own story and my own Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's like you, you almost have to fool yourself into believing. Yes. I've heard that someone else say that here. Yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah, and that's a real key thing that people seem to like. We're always trying to fool the audience into believing us, right? But you have to fool yourself first, right? You know, because that's the first, like we're really hard on ourselves, and you know, constantly hearing that voice saying you're lying, and you probably would have been like, you didn't wrap this, like like this is right. a costume, like this right. is this is not you, it's not you being this person. That might have happened. Right, which is why you always hear the term raise the stakes, you know? Mm. And that's a very important thing to do because it makes everything stronger. But what does that even mean, right? Like, how do you raise the stakes? And um, I always find the more vivid my objectives are. So I, was, I have one which is terrible for feeling real rage and anger and that's um i have a little small yorkie a mm -hmm. teacup yorkshire mm -hmm. terrier <laughs> and the thought of someone putting out cigarettes mm. on my it's a hot i mean it's yeah. just the most horrifying thing yeah. and these are the kind of things that go through your head yeah. as an actor right yeah, just yeah, yeah. really twisted stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um but it has to be that vivid otherwise it won't stick mm. And so I think all of that is important, just to have very strong um, motives and strong images of what you're really going for. You were trying to be really conscious in that movie not to do anything. And I think you gave the example of like putting your hands on your hips mm -hmm. that just appeared modern, you know? And that might have been um, easier for someone who wasn't playing someone in that particular area in the world, in that particular time. time period, yeah. Right. Is that a restraint on you that interferes with your acting or does that help everything, having to f be thinking about something like that? I think it helps. I think it all helps because it's just more things to play with, really. Um, and I think a character like is imbued with life and color when you add more and more little details to them. And for that role, the details were how she walked, how she looked, how she moved, how she grew up, and, and her life story was entirely different from yeah. my own, obviously. Um, and I needed to be, and she's also a real person, right? I've, yeah. She also was a person who existed, and so I felt a real duty to not mess that up yeah. <laughs> and not all of a sudden come in as this American girl who's very yeah. clearly um, not immersed in yeah. that culture. Um, it was really important to me that I did that correctly. And speaking of American girl, right? <laughs> I mean, they were not necessarily looking for an American girl for this. Right. And so here you are, correct me if I'm wrong, you're trying to prove you're Indian enough to be right. this. Meanwhile, in other roles, you're trying to show that you're not, not Indian, Indian enough for the, for the role. On, honestly, it's a little crazy. It, it has boggled my mind wh where we are right now as an industry. Mm. Um, because I spend so much of my time doing things that I don't think are valuable in the grand scheme of things because it's either convincing people I am Indian enough to play the Indian roles which I never am sometimes I am yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or convincing them that I'm American enough 
which I also rarely yeah. am. And it's this weird black and white thing where the industry is just looking for people from a very certain part of the world. And if you're not exactly that, mm. you're not it, right? They, they would rather not get in trouble mm -hmm. for casting someone who's not exactly the profile that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so, and I've been asked now this past year many times what my ethnic background is. And I always mm. wonder if they're like, are you even allowed to ask that? <laughs> right. I guess people are asking that now. Um, and the tough thing is ethnically where I fall is an Indian girl born and raised in America, right? That is what I am. My parents are Indian and I was born and raised here in Manhattan. But unfortunately, the only things written for that type are girls who want to code, whose parents just want them to have an arranged marriage, <laughs> yeah. but they don't want to and they can't find a boyfriend. And it's this niche as well that's now been created that many Indian girls don't necessarily fall into. Yeah. So I think the pendulum is swinging a little bit back in the other mm. direction. Right now everyone is being so careful. Um, I was offered a role recently that then was taken away because they found out I wasn't Middle Eastern, wow. right? And it's just, you can't, be upset about any of this because this industry is a wild thing yeah. and I'm so lucky and happy that I get to be in it and then I get to act and I have the opportunity to do that. Um, so you kind of just have to take it as it comes and then you have to be proactive about your own projects and really um, get involved on a level not just in the acting realm where mm. you're just relying on your agents and managers to get you into those rooms mm -hmm. um, because I think after a while there's only so much there's only so much that can do but I love it and I always tell I'm now I've now been asked by a number of young actors not that I'm not young mm. um, who are trying to get into the biz uh, if I have any advice and I always tell them that if there's anything else that you would be happy doing you should probably <laughs> do that um, and for me there was not anything else that I was going to be happy doing I mean I graduated from Johns Hopkins which is not what you think about when you think about mm -hmm. um, acting schools John Aston, who was Gomez Adams and the original mm -hmm. Adams family. He was my mentor, is mm -hmm. my mentor, um, and was the head of the program, again, is the head of the program at Hopkins. Uh, and a magnificent man, just really a magnificent mm -hmm. person, um, and really helped me navigate all of these waters while I started out in the industry. Um, but I played with the idea of doing something else. You know, I majored in art history. I thought maybe I'd work in that realm. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if it's your calling, it is what it is. <laughs>
um, and also just culturally and being raised in that way. Um, many Indian parents, mine included, believe that complimenting or giving praise to your child is not in the best interest of the child. Mm -hmm. um, whether that be because of evil eye mm -hmm. or because of um, an idea that the child will become a brat. I'm not really... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That um, definitely exists. And I think it's made me a tougher person. Um, and I'm grateful actually for that. Um, and because I started learning Indian classical dance from such a young age, she became my teacher at a very early age as well. Um, and she takes that craft and that art form very seriously um, and believes that no exceptions should be made for anyone, especially her daughter, right? So I feel that I had to work twice as hard just to prove that I was worthy of that craft um, because that really is um, that really is how she thinks about it and many people think about it as as do I it's an incredibly hard craft to master and you don't ever really master it right you mm -hmm. just keep learning and learning as with acting mm -hmm. um, and She's a terrifically creative person, obviously. Um, she's choreographed many of her own uh, dances and plays on uh, Broadway. But the movie side of her career happened very recently, mm. obviously. And it was something that I was going into. And we obviously talk a lot about the, the projects that I'm doing. and, and I laugh, it's like a legally blonde moment, um, mm -hmm. but I've always been calling her Elle Woods because one fine day she just w woke up and decided she wanted to be a director, <laughs> right? And she really had that idea of like, what? Like, it's hard. She's like, uh, why? I'll direct it. <laughs> and she had no... I think if she knew how hard it was going to be, she might not have done it, mm. actually. So maybe it was nice that she was like, what? Like, it's hard? It's not hard. And if you ask her now, she'd be like, ah, it wasn't hard. It was a breeze. <laughs> um, but there's something amazing about someone who's not in the industry just jumping in because it gives you a new pair of eyes that really yes. hasn't been tainted almost by yes. anything else. And, you know, when we were writing this, I, I would give examples that be like, well, like that movie, that last year, or this movie, and she doesn't even really watch movies. <laughs> it's just insane. Yeah. So it's just this completely unique point of view, mm -hmm. which is really, really rare to come by. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really valuable, I think, yeah. to have on this project. Um, and it was a labor of love. It just, it sounds like it. I mean, so this is a a real story and mm -hmm. every indian knows this story mm -hmm. right and you so you guys are essentially bringing this to the rest of the world that might not know about this right when you guys are writing this are you thinking like you have to be ronnie right so you're you guys are writing this and you're thinking mom you're going to direct i'm going to star we are not thinking mom is going to direct when you at were, this when you were, okay um, she is a producer, naturally. Um, she has produced a number of theatrical productions. She brought the Kunshu Opera to India. She brought a, num you know, a number of Indian classical artists to New York um, and sponsored them with visas and uh, to have concerts here. And so that is naturally what she has a lot of experience with. So she was going to produce it, and we were going to hire someone to direct it. Um, and that was always something we had planned to do, because we understand that the mother-daughter relationship, director-actor, might be too complicated to just throw into the mm -hmm. water at this point. Um, but as we kept going, 
she was really the only clear option. So you know, cool. you needed someone who had a deep knowledge of Indian culture, but who also had a Western eye. Yeah. You needed someone who knew the history, but also had the women's angle as mm -hmm. right. I mean, we weren't gonna hire a man to direct this. Mm -hmm. That would seem kind of counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought of a lot of people who we thought could be right, but the passion that she had for it is just not something that you can hire out, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, it really it had to be her. It wasn't a choice. It just was That's what, so cool. it was the only option. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we had a conversation about that, about what that would look like on set yeah. and what that would look like for the whole project. And um, it was the right choice, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's how we made it, though. It was, it kind of happened. That's amazing. There is so much uh, 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 swordplay, horseback, riding like intense horseback riding that you had to train for right. and like you're doing all this yourself so i was in talks for a project about the same story uh. years prior that as movies do completely fell apart um but so i'd already started training um in horseback riding martial arts mm. um all of that and so, and I also, as a child, did horseback ride. And again, as I was saying, Indian classical dance is an athletic thing. Um, you really have to have a lot of stamina to do that. And so I was primed for that anyway, obviously closer to the shoot. I had to do months of just that kind of training. Um, but the toughest thing for me were the languages, because I had to speak two Indian languages. Mm. And both of them happen to be the ones that I know. Hindi is the national, one of the national languages of India with English. And Marathi is the mother tongue of my parents, um, spoken in Maharashtra, which is the state that Mumbai is in. Mm. So those are the two languages that she spoke as well. Um, and that is what I had to master, not only the language, but 19th century versions oh. of those language, of those languages, yeah. which was incredibly difficult. And for me, I think because I trained in Indian classical dance my whole life, I'm used to relying on my body in that way. So I can just trust that my body will be able to horseback ride and mm -hmm. sword fight and get through those rigorous, rigorous scenes. But trusting myself to recreate ancient Indian dialects of languages that I don't speak regularly mm -hmm. um, was, I'd say, the hardest challenge for me in this. Um, mm -hmm. And India is a big place with a lot of people who are critical, right? So it's not, and yeah. and I'm playing this iconic heroine, you know? She's she's yeah. known and adored by It would all. be like playing Joan of Arc in, Fran in for, Fran for the Fran in, in, for, right, in France. Right, <sighs> and yeah. doing it incorrectly is not yeah. really an option. But maybe that's not even a good example because so many, of, so many people have done Joan of Arc already. Nobody has really done this yet, right? right? So right. it's like it's like doing it for the first time, like doing Joan of Arc for the first time, right? right? Was, Not long after, right? Hundred and some years after. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so this movie um, was made in 1953. Mm. It's called The Tiger and the Flame, uh -huh. um, and it was black and white. Uh, Saurabh Modi directed it, and ever since then, many many people have tried to make this project. Uh -huh and things fall apart and it's because you're making a period piece action drama yeah. with a brown woman yeah. as the yeah. lead and so it's so much that goes into a project that in this day and age people are not willing to 
bet on a minority yeah. woman leading such a big venture. Right. Um, and that's why these projects don't really get made anymore. And I found out recently that this is the first ever Hollywood action movie to have a female Indian lead, which is kind of insane. Pause for a second. Let that sink in <laughs> to people listening. That is insane. But that, that, does that fill you with pride? Does that fill you with fright? <laughs> oh, it fills me. <laughs> what does it fit? It's a complex uh, feeling. And it's, I don't feel pride that I did anything, you know, I think it's amazing that we get to tell this story now. Um, and it fills me with a feeling of want. And by that, I mean the want as in lack of, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just, it's so clear to me that more stories like this need to be told and that Asian women are not adequately represented in Hollywood. Um, and people aren't really talking about it, yeah. actually. Um, and I have a theory um, that it has a little bit to do with Asian culture. And I know that because I was raised in an Asian household um, to two a Asian parents. And there's a mentality of if things aren't going your way, put your head down and work harder, mm. right? And I think because of that mentality, it's harder to speak out about the injustice that exists, right? Because you don't want to sound yeah. like you're complaining yeah. about things. And yet, Sandra Oh was the first ever Asian woman to be nominated for an Emmy in that category, like last year, right? Mm -hmm. so, which, it's just crazy to me that we aren't talking about this yes. more. Um, and I think I'm incredibly proud that we get to bring this movie to a global audience and get to say, okay, we're starting to see brown women leading movies and not as the wife, not as the girlfriend, yeah. not as the sidey character who has an appearance, but really the stories about them. Um, and I think we just need to make more. Your performance has this power like you're, you're 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 pulling a power from somewhere, and you had to though. Like right. there, there's there you're you're leading a a charge here. Right. In the moment filming this, like w was that part coming easy for you? I think we had so much to handle on set. I mean, shooting in India comes with its own complications as well. We shot in England as well, and Ridley Scott ended up re-shooting all of the scenes with Kevin Spacey um, oh. in our location. <laughs> and two days before we were supposed to shoot, we were told, sorry, Ridley Scott wants this space, goodbye. Wow. <laughs> and we had to find a new location. Oh. So things like that come up all the time as well. Um, and so I think because things moved so quickly, there wasn't an opportunity to really sink in, you know, have what is going on, the gravity um, and the huge, the enormity of what is happening really sink into my skin. And I remember the day before we started to shoot was a very long day for me because it was a day of rest and reflection and meditation and whatever. And because I had that time, I really started to grasp what um, enormous pressure there was on me to not mess this up. Mm -hmm. And um, it was it, it was tough. But at the end of you know, you don't have a choice. You know, we had put in so much time and energy mm -hmm. and yeah. thought into this project that now I couldn't. I couldn't uh, give up, and I think, I think that was really what it was for me, where I put myself down the path of what is the worst possible outcome of this movie, right? It doesn't get made halfway through, something happens. 
would I rather have not done it at all? Or would I rather have tried and given it my all? Um, what if everyone hates it, right? That's obviously something that, what if everyone hates me in it, right? These are all things that you think about and it has to be worth it and you have to look deep inside yourself to see if you're proud of your own work and not look for anyone outside because it's a, it's a slippery slope, right? If you become happy when you get external validation from anybody, then you're leaving yourself open to become incredibly upset when people say negative things about you. Um, and so you have to just push it all out. You really do. I completely forgot what your question was. I don't. I don't remember either. But it felt. It feels like you answered it. And I. And <laughs> I I'm. Like, I don't care I what it was. <laughs> because what you said is really important. And what you said right in the end there is really really important for people to hear, though. Power. You asked where I yeah, got my yeah. power. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, yeah. I think I didn't, I think it's what I was talking about earlier, that I didn't have a choice. She was a powerful woman because she was put in a place where she needed to be and she needed to draw that power in order to get things done. And it's the same thing with acting where if you overthink, okay, where can I draw my power from? Where will I pull it? Where? that can send you into a spiral. And for me, it was, I have to be powerful right now because if I crumble, this whole production will yeah, crumble. Yeah. You know, I don't have the leisure to lose it right now. And I think that was the greatest gift that I had on the set, that the stakes mm -hmm. were so high the whole time that I didn't have an opportunity to break down in yeah. any kind of way. And if I did, I probably would have taken it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really would Thank have God because yeah. we were sleeping a couple of hours a night. I mean, it is absolutely exhausting and it's the first time I've ever been in a role that's shot consecutive days for three months, you know? Wow. And you think you'll be completely off book, you think you've prepared, you think all those things. And then you get to set, you haven't slept in days, and you look at the lines and you're like, I'm sorry, where, what is this again? <laughs> where am I? What's going on? Um, and you just have to power through and you need to trust that you can do it and not overthink how crazy it is that a lot of this hinges on you, right? right? And I had to think about that because we did all of the horseback riding scenes and because of insurance, I wasn't allowed to uh, canter, which is the gate, which is closest oh, yeah. to a gallop. Yeah. Um, it's walk, trot, canter. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't allowed to canter because if I fell off and yeah. I hurt myself, whatnot. Um, but a trot, objectively, if you're not allowed to post, which is the rising action mm -hmm. in a trot, a trot on camera looks, looks like a... silly. I mean, oh, it just oh. looks bizarre, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. You're just bouncing about yeah. on the saddle and I'm playing this badass warrior queen, right? I'm not going to be you know, bouncing around, right? So um, I talked to the producers and everyone said, you know, you have to do a seated trot. Um, there's no way around it. And I said, okay. And I made eye contact with the DP and the second camera guy. And I was like, you sure you have the framing, everything set? And they're like, yep. And I was like, you, you positive? You've done the, the, okay. So I went around the tree and I kicked the horse into a canter and I did a full canter. This is the worst thing I've done as an actress. Um, and afterwards I got yelled at, of course. Um, and I apologized profusely saying, you know, I must have lost control of my horse. I shouldn't be allowed to do this anymore today with this horse. So, but I made sure that the DP, but they got the did, shot. But they got the shot. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, but I just sometimes you need to take risks as well. And in a lot of those scenes and during the war scenes, my mother actually allowed me 
to Cantor. And it was only because all of my other scenes were done, yeah. right? So it was like, well, <laughs> if anything happens now, if you break your leg, I'll kill you. Yeah. But your scenes are done. So fine, you can do it once. Yeah. Um, but it was all of that navigating as well, which was interesting because as my mother, she may have a certain take, but then as the director, right. she'll have a totally different take. Um, and I think she was pretty good at wearing those two separate mm. hats. And I think I was pretty good at wearing the actor hat and the daughter hat Yeah, totally separately. And does that mean that there's a future for you guys together doing another movie? <laughs> I don't know. This was such a crazy project yeah. that we did it was an insane idea it was her idea um and i played along for a little bit because i was h humoring her yeah. uh -huh. um and before i knew it we were ready to go i mean we were gonna shoot this thing um so it all happened very quickly i don't know she has a lot of ideas for things as do i yeah um and there's so much content, again, about India and about the Indian American experience that just mm. hasn't been mm -hmm. made. And Mindy Kaling is such an amazing, awesome uh, person to have been able to bring those uh, stories here. Um, but there need to be more. And I have hilarious anecdotes um, just growing up in the 90s on the mm. Upper East Side, being mm. one of the only, one of two brown girls in my class, and every parent thought I was the other one, right? <laughs> it's just, growing up like that, I think, gives you a sense of humor, because you have to laugh. I mean, yeah. it's just so absurd, and things are changing, but I think we definitely need, need exposure for those kinds of stories. Are you in a, in a place now where you have the urge to turn down so, mu so many bad things and this other voice telling you, you have to keep working? Are those two competing voices where it's like, I'm not going to do the girlfriend in the terrible script even i don't care who who the person is that's doing it and who, how who the other star is yeah you know are your people getting frustrated with your pickiness are people pushing you toward things that you don't want to do it's so interesting that you say that because it's something i've definitely been struggling with um but i think it's actually the other problem for me mm. interestingly enough um, I have turned down a number of roles this past year and it's a difficult thing to do as an actor because every bone in your body sees an opportunity to act as an opportunity to act and mm. turning my nose down on that is not something that I am really okay with in my depths, right? Because if you are an actor and you love that craft as deeply as I do, any opportunity to do that is a gift. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why acting class is so important almost because it gives you an opportunity to just play, right? Yeah. When, when we don't really get to do that that often. That being said, I've turned down some roles and it's, it's tough to do for all of those reasons, but also, at a certain point in your career, it's necessary. Um, and I also believe that I only want to do roles that I feel strongly about. And, and if I love that role and I think it's an interesting, complex character, I know that I'll do a better job because I will do the yeah. research and I will do all the homework and I will come in with a fully colored sense of what that character is, where if I'm playing this girlfriend who's ditzy or whatnot, it's an easier thing to just walk on set and have my sides and just mm -hmm. read it off the, the cuff. Um, 
and just be lazy about it. So it's important to only choose roles that are meaty because I know I will do my personal best if they are. Um, but it's conflicting to turn down roles. It definitely is. And it's something I've struggled with a little bit. But the correct answer is that I should only gravitate to and choose and accept roles that I'm really eager about because otherwise I won't do that well. Mm -hmm. Are you optimistic about this business? I am. And I'm optimistic about this business because I'm optimistic about people. Um, and we're moving away from the years where the industry is controlled by a very small handful of people. Um, there's so much content and there's so many amazing creative people who are creating new content every day. Um, and because of that, because of how easy it is to make a movie, it's not that easy. It was very difficult, but maybe 20 years ago, you know, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish this. Um, and so the more we see that, the more we see, quote unquote, outsiders creating content and being able to stick our heads into this industry, um, the more hope I have. Devika Bizet, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>